Welcome to People Tech, the podcast of the HCM Technology Report. I'm Mark Pfeffer. Today, I'm speaking with Joanna Kim Brunetti, Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and General Counsel for Trusaic. Their compliance software helps businesses reduce their risks, maximize opportunities, and keep up with constantly changing regulatory requirements. We're going to talk about software, data, and using them to stay compliant on this edition of People Tech. Joanna, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Can you tell me about Trusaic? What is it that you do and who do you do it for? Okay. Um, Trusaic is a workforce regulatory compliance software company. That's a mouthful. But basically, we help uh, organizations reduce their risk, maximize strategic opportunities, and keep up with a rapidly changing regulatory landscape worldwide. So what this does is... What we do is we provide um, compliance software um, overlaid with uh, expertise. And so whether it is in the uh, ACA space, um, whether it's in the DEI space, because those two environments have a regulatory and an analytics portion, we basically have sort of a triad of um, services. It's the analytics it's the regulatory expertise, and uh, with that, our sort of professional overlay in terms of handling the data. So that's, you know, sort of generally speaking, what we do and what we provide. Um, you know, our clients are, are not industry specific. It's just whatever organizations have workforce regulatory requirements. So for example, um, organizations that have um, pay, uh, pay data reporting, uh, you know, th- those, uh, agencies. So for example, California recently, uh, instituted this pay data reporting with very specific regulatory requirements for compliance. It involves a lot of data analytics because what you're doing is you are submitting a report of pay and pay has a very specific meaning for certain employees who are also specifically defined for a specific uh, jurisdictional um, group and then submitting that report. And so that process involves a lot of data, a lot of regulatory understanding and uh, you know, o- over that, um, you know, basically the uh, platform to run all those analytics and submit that to the agency. Now that's part of, you know, for the pay equity space, then you have this overall, um, you know, litigation and regulatory agency risk um, pertaining to pay discrimination. So it's not enough just to get all the data to submit the pay data reporting. But the question is, well, what exactly have you submitted? What are you telling the agency that where you are in terms of uh, whether or not there are pay, pay disparities? So the pay data reporting um, provides um, just sort of the raw numbers of, for example, on the gender level, you know, what women are making as compared to men for each job position. But that pay data reporting doesn't take into account what I call legitimate business factors. And what they are, are like things like the reason why Susie is getting paid less than John is because Susie has one year of experience and John has 10 years of experience in a role where they have basically the same function, but John, Uh, You know, he is getting compensated for his deeper understanding, experience, what have you. So seniority, for example, tenure. There are other factors that justify why one person is getting paid more than another, um, even though they are ostensibly performing the same function. So the pay data reporting will identify just what Susie is getting as compared to John. What a pay equity audit will do is show what Susie is getting paid to John with respect to, you know, when you account for those factors, you know, and what you'll see is the pay data reporting might suggest super large gaps, whereas a pay equity audit will, you know, shrink that gap and perhaps eliminate it. And so that those kind of analytics involve statistical regression and modeling, 
Um, our software um, has been developed by a PhD statistician uh, who oversees the program. And, um, and so what our solution provides to our clients is not only reporting per various regulatory requirements, but also you know, proactively conducting an, uh, an analysis of the pay equity to see if really are there pay equity, uh, is there pay inequity? And it also identifies, um, because of all this the statistical analysis, it can help identify where there are problems and it gives uh, employers an opportunity to remediate um, and uh, you know, figure out what the problem is. And you know, if you don't know what the problem is, you don't know how to fix it. So that's our sort of pay parity solution. Um, we also uh, we also provide for clients just a larger on a larger scale, not just the pay parity piece, but also the diversity, um, equity, and other aspects, not just pay, whether it's uh, development opportunities, hiring, uh, promotions, as well as inclusion. It's a mouthful, but that's just generally what we provide in that space. And and who are your customers? Well, we, you know, uh, we are industry agnostic because um, there really isn't any uh, sort of client type that doesn't have these kind of regulatory requirements because our solutions are triggered by the regulatory requirements as opposed to, um, you know, the type of industry, like all employers, um, you know, are subject to these requirements, regardless of what kind of business they run. So it's really not, uh, you know, a type of industry specific. Having said that, we tend to provide solutions for larger organizations, um, you know, employers in the, say, for example, less than 50, they're, they're uh, you know, they have a much smaller number of employees. And so they, the regulatory requirements aren't as triggered as, as uh, with the same frequency. Okay. Um, now, we're living in an interesting time right now. You know, we're, we're in the yes, middle. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, you know, 18 months into the pandemic, politics is weird. You know, the business climate's unsettled. Um, how, how is that impacting your business? Well, that's, that's a really interesting question. So, you know, with respect to our DEI solution, um, just over the last few years and really kind of accelerated by COVID uh, between Time's Up, Me Too, the kind of aftermath of, um, uh, you know, the death of George Floyd, um, all of these events over the last few years, and then just, you know, the nail in the coffin with COVID, it's really showing this disparate impact uh, between uh, men and women, uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, the sort of disparate impact uh, for people of color. And so what that really has done is it's highlighted the need for DEI. And the reality is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, that's been around, the concept has been around for a long time. Um, and quite frankly, over the years uh, in the past, there's been a lot of lip service where you know everybody wants that, but you know are they actually doing anything about it? And so we actually conducted uh, you know, we sponsored uh, a survey uh, conducted by Harvard Business Review in partnership with SHRM to look into sort of DEI. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned with COVID really kind of really putting a fire on this issue, um, we're seeing that it's becoming increasingly important and lip service is just not enough. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also seeing that uh, when we did this survey, what we've seen is the DEI programs to date um, Definitely, vast majority, they, they understand that it's a strategic priority, um, but the reality is there's a lot of sort of great intentions, but limited success. And so we're seeing that, it's, that the, the limited success is becoming less and less of an acceptable uh, outcome. And uh, you know, with COVID really highlighting the uh, huge pay problem with respect to uh, people of color uh, and women, and um, they're seeing that, it, you know, they got to do something about it. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, 
But this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. You know, let me ask a follow-up on that, which is you, you keep hearing um, you keep hearing stories about employees becoming more demanding, um, you know, really expecting their employers to provide real solutions and um, <clears throat> enact real programs that are actually going to have some kind of impact. Um, do you see that and do you think that it's actually happening? I think it's happening more. Um, and that's, you know, um, there's this thing called an inclusion survey. Um, and what that does is it measures employees' perceptions. That's not necessarily what's actually going on, but it's how employees feel about things. And, you know, the fact that I use the word feel doesn't, I'm not trying to suggest it's not important. It's extremely important because without employees, no organization can succeed. So these inclusion surveys, which, you know, can be tailored to each organization, that does is it sort of captures how they feel about anywhere from, uh, you know, do they feel like they're valued at the company um, to, you know, do they believe that uh, there's sufficient diversity within their organization? I mean, it could be any kind of question, but with employees demanding more, having this inclusion survey is really important to kind of gauge what it is they want, um, what the employer can do to sort of bridge sort of what, what the employers can provide to employees and uh, you know, what employees want from their employers. Um, you know, the, the inclusion survey is really important um, just from the overall DEI. And importantly, inclusion is not focused um, specifically on, uh, you know, improving diversity or um, from a uh, person of color or non-male. It is about everybody, whatever, you know, whatever interests you have, uh, whatever category you fit into. It's about employees' feeling included as part of the organization. And uh, as I alluded to earlier about the survey that was conducted on the, really one of the key barriers to DEI success is inclusion or the, the notion of the lack of culture uh, of, of DEI being important, um, the sort of inclusivity of, uh, of folks within an organization. I'm not sure I answered the question, but uh, uh, I think the key point is that employees, uh, the inclusion survey is critical to sort of bridging between what employees are looking for, what they want. And, and I hear you, I, I do think employees expect more. Uh, but part of it, the concept of expecting more is to understand what it is they expect. And so, you know, doing that kind of survey really helps, um, you know, sort of giving them what they want. Okay. Now, I was looking at your website, and one of the things it says is that regulations can be an opportunity to demonstrate transparency and integrity. Could you talk about that? Um, you know, I, I read it and I wondered, well, how do you turn regulatory activity into how you're perceived or you know, something along those lines? Okay, sure. So um, a sort of easy example is you know regulatory requirements dealing with pay data reporting um, that at least in the US that pay data reporting is not uh, transparent yet. Um, I believe Illinois just uh, enacted some uh, new laws where pay data reporting will be transparent where they're going to be posted you know certain metrics that come out of the pay data reporting onto um, you know the state's, uh, website, uh, agency website. So, you know, you have these regulations and, you know, the vast majority, at least within the U.S., 
is to just submit it, you know, if you're going to submit it, it's to an agency sort of un, under this sort of confidentiality veil. And so the idea is, you know, like Illinois, where they're pushing that, where it's not just um, submitting it to an agency, but having that kind of transparency to employees is, is really important in this sort of DEI success, you know, and these, these sort of considerations all kind of bleed into each other. They, they are not siloed. Um, the, if you, if you actually do the pay, uh, sort of pay data, conduct the reporting, do the pay equity analytics, um, the idea is you, you take those results, you share them with the employees and, um, you know, you may not have actually achieved success, but if you take those results, um, and, share them with your employees and show your plan on how you're going to get to equity. That's going to have a humongous effect from an inclusivity standpoint. Um, you know, the survey that we conducted is part of this inclusivity uh, aspect was the notion that the, the, you know, the management was actually being transparent of what's going on. There's been increasing expectation of pay transparency from the standpoint of like the vast majority of uh, employees today in the various states now, you know, th there used to be kind of, you know, sort of secrecy in who's getting paid what. Mm -hmm. um, there's less of a trend for that. Um, you know, the, there's been new laws that basically say uh, employees are, cannot be retaliated against for sharing that information. And there is this push to, you know, for everybody to know what everyone else is getting paid, not necessarily individually, but as a company. Um, and these regulations are really, you know, kind of on, on the one hand pushing that, and then on the market forces on the other hand, pushing this transparency. So using the regulations, like, you know, you can be defensive about it and uh, basically wait until the law makes you do it. Or you can be, you know, you could get ahead of that, um, do the pro, you know, sort of pay equity uh, audit to figure out where you are, because, you know, you can't really have a message when you don't even know where you are. Um, if you do that, um, because these regulations will eventually get there, but get ahead of that, um, use those existing regulations from this sort of pay data reporting that is already going to be submitted to an agency, for example. Um, use that to share information with your employees. Um, that transparency, you know, uh, sort of the DEI success space, there's sort of two avenues um, and they both need to work together. Uh, on, the, on the top level, you need management to sort of have a plan and execute it. Um, and the, on the, from a bottom up standpoint, you need employees to feel like they're part of the solution, um, that they are included in it. And so that transparency, they all, they work together, um, you know, simultaneously. You can't just have, uh, you know, one without the other. It's not as effective. Um, so, you know, our view is you can use these regulations, like use that to, you know, springboard into, um, disclosures to your employees about where you are, you know, where you're, where you want to be and how you're going to get there. And you need to have the metrics to do that. If, you know, like a lot of perceptions, uh, and as I mentioned, inclusivity, these sort of inclusion surveys, they just capture, I mean, it's important from a metric standpoint, like who feels, you know, what number of people feel about a certain thing, but they don't, they're not necessarily capturing what's actually going on. So for example, employees might feel that the company is not diverse at all. But if you actually look at the metrics, um, you know, as compared to um, the geographic location, it actually is very representative of the location. Um, you know, and at the same time, uh, you, you know, uh, you can find out if they're, it, how they feel about the programs that are in place and how effective they are. So, you know, you, you know, you, the inclusion survey actually sort of creates metrics for you to figure out how to craft your plan. Um, so you know, these are all things that are kind of amorphous because, uh, you know, you got to start somewhere. Um, you, you need to um, 
have a plan. Once you have a plan, figure out the metrics of, you know, where your baseline is, where you want to be, how you're going to get there, uh, how you measure accountability, um, you know, and all of these, uh, the, the pay transparency uh, that's going to come out of this part of this sort of plan um, you know, you start with the regulation, you come out with the pay transparency. Uh, I'm not sure I answered the question, <laughs> but yeah, these are the things to consider. Okay. Actually, I think you did answer the question. So thank you. Um, I want to, I want to shift gears and, um, ask, ask something that's more about the business. Um, you have relationships with a number of HR technology vendors like ADP. And I wanted to ask, how do those relationships fit into your business model? What do they do for you? Uh, well, what they do is it gives us, you know, exposure to additional clients. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're very proud of our solution, um, but not uh, you know, we want to increase our exposure. Um, ADP is a great platform because it has a wide variety of clients. Um, and really, um, you know, all employers, even employers under 50, need to take a look at this. And so it really gives us uh, an avenue for, uh, you know, additional clients that may not be familiar with our services. Well, Joanna, thanks very much for being here today. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me. My guest today has been Joanna Kim Brunetti, the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and General Counsel for TrueSec. And this has been People Tech, the podcast of the HCM Technology Report. We're a publication of Recruiting Daily. We're also a part of Evergreen Podcasts. To see all of their programs, visit www.evergreenpodcasts.com. And to keep up with HR technology, visit the HCM Technology Report every day. We're the most trusted source of news in the HR tech industry. Find us at www.hcmtechnologyreport.com. I'm Mark Pfeffer. Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with a purpose and a passion, whether you're 25, 85, or any age in between. Gain actionable financial and mindset tips from your favorite authors, podcasters, and influencers to help you reach that exciting next chapter. Listen now and start building your path to financial freedom and reframing what retirement can mean to you. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate. The world's best-known investor and Wall Street expert Warren Buffett once said, Wall Street is the only place that people ride to in a Rolls Royce to get advice from those who take the subway. Mr. Buffett's quote is remarkably accurate, but how many people would rather receive advice from him than someone simply guessing? Welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell, your single source for Wall Street knowledge and profitable guidance. Please join me, Todd Schoenberger, and fellow trader Tobin Smith, as well as host Veronica Dudo for a podcast known to move the needle for investors. Tobin and I are seasoned Wall Street executives with deep investment experience, and we are prepared to share our advice to those who choose to listen. Download Buy, Hold, Sell today on the Evergreen Podcast Network or your favorite podcast channel.